Greetings, friends. Greetings from Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, occupied East Jerusalem. Greetings from a very troubled uh, part of the world, from uh, Palestine and Israel. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you again during a Kumi meeting, an update on what's happening in Palestine and Israel. It's a pleasure to have a good friend of ours, Jeff Helper. And not when I say a good friend of ours, not only of Omar, of Sabil, um, but also of many of the people who are actually attending this meeting. Everybody knows Jeff Helper. Um, Jeff Helper is a remarkable person. Um, I have to say one of the most brilliant minds. I am I'm part of Sabil um, when we lead groups. And there's two kinds of speakers when you meet. Um, um, when you meet, uh, um, when you, you arrange for meetings between the groups and uh, and the speaker. And usually more or less, most of the speakers have their own story that they share. It's either a personal story or a special input. Jeff Helper, you cannot have the same talk twice. And that means that he's a very deep thinker. He's always um, interacting and developing and reflecting on what's happening in the land. Um, I know that it is it's his books. He has plenty of books, but and some of his books are actually there's a new book that is being translated into Arabic or is going to be published soon in Arabic. So um, Jeff Helper, um, we welcome you to, to this meeting. And sadly, um, many of us a few days ago received uh, the newsletter from ICAD, and ICAD gave us a very troubling report and findings on uh, home demolitions and the situation in the occupied territories. But there's also an ongoing development that is happening inside Israel. And um, we all know that Israel has Israel and like many parts of the world, there's a shrinking space for freedom. And it seems that we are moving farther and farther from democratic values and um, and respect for human dignity or even human rights. Uh, it seems that it is it's the pressure is also being felt by many Israeli uh, left groups that things are also changing also for Israelis. Um, which is also it's also also an incident. It's an indicator that things are becoming worse. So Jeff, um, we're all um, interested to hear what you have to share. Um, Jeff, can you please unmute? Sorry about that. <laughs> so maybe I'll say a few things and is there some time for discussion or some questions or should I just go? Okay, you can hear me? All right. Yes, I we can hear you. you. Okay, I can't hear you. Okay, fine. Well, first of all, thanks for inviting me, Omar. And uh, it's true, I, I probably know uh, most of the people in the group here, I tend to preach to the converted. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, you know, we're in, you know, difficult times as usual, but I think there's a difference uh, these days. Um, you know, uh, first of all, in terms of the bigger politics, you know, we also, we talk about settler colonialism <laughs> and we talk about apartheid and apartheid regime uh, and um, um, and so on, um, you know, and this has been an ongoing discussion for many, many, many years, of course. But all these, you know, these processes are finite. In other words, they don't go on forever. Um, settler colonialism, Zionist settler colonialism that began 130 years ago, had a very definite plan, agenda, and that was to take over Palestine to Judaize Palestine, to transform an Arab country into a Jewish country. That was the agenda. And it did it in a very systematic way, you know, from getting the backing, the legitimacy of the international community through the League of Nations mandate of 1922, and then the backing of the largest colonial power of its day, Great Britain, you know, uh, through that whole process leading to 1948 in a sense, breaking Palestinian resistance to colonialism already in the revolt 
of 1936, uh, where the Zionists and the British worked together uh, to break Palestinian resistance. And then, of course, in 48, taking 78% of Palestine, I, well, we can't forget the partition plan as well, that, but even though the Jews in 1947 were only a third of the population of Palestine, the UN gave them, uh, really with no authority, the UN has no authority to give one country to another people, but it gave the Jews, who was a third of the population, 56% of the country. And then when the war broke out, the Nakba in 1948, of course, by the end of 1948, Israel had grown to 78% uh, to of the country. And that was pretty much accepted by the international community, the 78%. And then we go into 1967, and of course, the rest of Palestine is taken in 1967. And since then, Israel has continued its settlement process. There are now about 800,000 Israeli settlers in East Jerusalem and the West Bank. Uh, and uh, the Palestinians, who are the majority population in this country between the historic Palestine, between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River today, are confined to about 15% of the land. In other words, areas A and B is about 164 islands in the West Bank, areas A and B, little enclaves in East Jerusalem, uh, Gaza, which is a closed concentration camp, and even inside Israel. You know, even though Palestinians, Palestinian citizens of Israel represent 20% of the Israeli population, they're confined by planning and regulations and laws and zoning to only three and a half percent of the land. So what we have today really is an apartheid system in which the majority Palestinian population of 51, 52 percent is confined to hundreds of islands uh, on about 15 percent of historic Palestine. Um, and, and so in a sense where we are today is mopping up. In other words, Israel has completed its 130-year campaign to Judaize Palestine. It controls the entire country from the Mediterranean to the Jordan River. Um, uh, it's able to settle the entire country and to take all the land it wants to, um, you know, with impunity, without any interference from the international community. On the contrary, Israel's international standing rises all the time. And now, of course, it's in a process of normalizing with much of the Arab world. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and the Palestinians have really been marginalized to, to a large degree. And, and, of course, they have the added problem of a collaborationist regime, which is the Palestinian Authority. You know, in other words, even their liberation leaders are, are collaborating. So it's a really dire situation for Palestinians. And, uh, and like I'm saying, I think we're at the end of that process. In other words, the settler colonial process, is establishing an apartheid regime, which is the only, if you can't displace all the Palestinians, the only thing you can do, if you want a Jewish state in a country in which the majority population is Palestinian, the only thing you can do is apartheid. So it's a natural outcome. Of, of the settler colonial idea, of the Judaization idea, and we're in the mopping up phase. So that basically uh, where we are is where we are. And I have a map I'll show you that really illustrates this very well. Uh, and it has to do with house demolitions. Of course, I'm the head of the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions. And demolitions is always at the forefront of this whole colonialization uh, process. We know that in 1948 and after 48, Israel demolished systematically more than 530 Palestinian villages, towns, and urban areas inside you know, what became Israel. Something like 60,000 homes, schools, mosques, community centers, businesses, farms uh, were all destroyed. Uh, you know, during the Nakba, and of course, 85% of the of the Palestinian population 
that had lived inside these new boundaries of Israel were, uh, were expelled uh, and became refugees. Um, so that house demolitions, and, and, and more than house demolitions, demolitions in general, really uh, were the instrument by which Israel cleared the land of Palestinians and took the land. And then, of course, rebuilding is the other phase of it, settlement. So house demolitions clears the land, takes the land, and then you settle the land uh, with Israelis. And that's now been repeated in the West Bank since 1967. Since 1967, Israel's demolished another 60,000 Palestinian structures. Uh, you know, we don't know exactly how many homes. I would estimate that of the 60,000, probably two thirds of, of those structures are homes. Uh, so the, the majority of, uh, of demolitions are homes. But Israel uses this term structures so that you can't really differentiate between things. So a structure can be a fence or it can be a, 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 an eight story apartment building. Um, but nevertheless, uh, uh, you know, this is what Israel's done in the West Bank since 1967 is in the same proportion as what it did during the Nakba in 1948. Um, about 60,000 Palestinian structures have been demolished. Again, homes and schools and farms and, uh, and mosques and, and community. In other words, entire, sometimes entire communities, Khan al Ahmar is now slated and there's a lot of pressure on the Israeli government uh, to eliminate this, pal this uh, Palestinian Bedouin community of Khan al Ahmar, the entire community. Uh, we know, for example, in, in Masafayata, this whole region to the south of Hebron and the south of Hebron Hills is being cleared of Palestinians. So it isn't only individual buildings, of course, uh, but it's, it's structures. And the other thing to emphasize here is that this is not done for security. In other words, kind of the knee-jerk common sense reaction is, well, these are homes of terrorists. You know, there's been a lot of talk about the uh, attacks in Jerusalem in the last couple of weeks and the Israeli government's decision to seal the houses and demolish the houses. So this whole idea is, of course, and most Israelis share this idea, is that, well, these demolitions are houses of terrorists, so, you know, Okay, it's, it's legitimate in a sense. Now, it isn't legitimate, even if they're homes of, 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 of terrorists or, 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 or people that do, a, a, you know, that do attacks, because that's collective punishment. And collective punishment itself is illegal. But what I'm trying to emphasize here is that only 1% of the 60,000 homes and other structures that have been demolished in the, in the occupied territory were demolished for security reasons, for punishment, revenge, um, security, you know, as a response to an attack. Uh, you know, something like 600 out of the 60,000 homes were demolished for security reasons, meaning that 99% of the homes were demolished uh, with nothing to do with security. They were demolished in order to clear the land in order to displace the Palestinians and either shove them into these areas A and B or to induce them to leave the country completely. And that's what you see on this map here. You see, this is a map of demolitions from 2004 to, uh, to 2019, I think. And, um, and uh, uh, one minute, I... One second. And, and what you see here is that the demolitions, um, uh, you know, the demolitions follow a real pattern. I'm trying to, uh, old men that are, aren't very good technologically. Let's see, wait a minute. Coming back to this thing. Here. Um, okay, so what you see here on, uh, on the, the red dots are all the demolitions that have not been, you know, been done for planning purposes, not security related. And, and the pattern is very clear. 
uh, you could see the demolitions occur in the Jordan Valley. They occur uh, between the uh, Malia Dumim and Jerusalem going across the West Bank. They occur as you go up uh, uh, through um, the South Hebron Hills towards Hebron. In other words, you can see that, and, and of course, around the Jerusalem area. So you can see the demolitions happen in areas that Israel wants to clear. Uh, it doesn't happen that much in the north, uh, partly because, you know, that's where this, the, the Janine and Nablus and, and some of the larger cities are. Uh, and in fact, in those areas, Palestinians have a little more stronger claims to the land than they do in the re rest of the West Bank. And so, you know, Israel on purpose, you know, avoids areas A and B. You can see the whole area in the middle around Ramallah and Salafit. And then, of course, uh, uh, this whole uh, area um, uh, to the east, uh, in the, sub the southeastern part of the West Bank, that Israel doesn't have to demolish in because it's declared it a, 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 um, a nature reserve that Palestinians are not allowed to live in. But what you can see in the patterns then is in, in the land that Israel wants for its settlement, you see the Jordan Valley, and the area between Jerusalem and the Jordan Valley uh, and, and uh, the Jerusalem area and the Hebron area, that's where the demolitions are. And again, what the, the, you know, the, the, the point of this map is that these are what you might say voluntary demolitions. These aren't demolitions that have been forced on Israel for security reasons. These are proactive demolitions, you see, that are done in order to clear this land of Palestinians. And you can see that the clearing of the land conforms completely to the second, to, you know, to the, to the other side of the equation, which is settlement building. So house demolitions, in other words, what I'm trying to say is that house demolitions uh, play a key role in, um, in, um, uh, in, um, uh, you know, in the in the whole process of of um, uh, of, uh, of settlement, and and that's where we're at the end of the uh, of the process. Um, okay, can you see me again? Yes, we can. Okay, so I took off the map. So that's pretty much where we are. Uh, you know, in other words, we're you know, and I think this is one of the things that's feeding into the. Um, uh, into the clashes that are going on today, you know, within Israel, with the Netanyahu government, uh, because, um, you know, Israel's trying to play a very delicate uh, dance, where on the one hand, it wants to maintain its in international legitimacy. It's doing very well so far. It's succeeding in imposing an apartheid colonial regime on the entire country in a way that South Africa never could. So from that point of view, it's succeeding. It's also succeeding in normalizing with the Arab world, which is touchy because the governments do not have the support of the Arab street. One thing we saw during the World Cup in football and soccer, you know, was a tremendous support that the peoples of the Arab world gave to the Palestinians, despite their government's uh, normalization, in Morocco in particular. So that, you know, so that, you know, on the one hand, Israel has been trying to sort of keep everything under the radar and, and you know, uh, for the international community and the Arab world. But on the other hand, it's in the process of mopping up and of nailing down this apartheid system. And that's where Ben Gvir and Smotrich come in, you know, these two settlers that have taken over the government of the West Bank. You know, Basel Smotrich, who's now the, um, um, you know, uh, he's a minister in the defense ministry and the minister of finance, uh, has responsibility for the civil administration, which is the government of the occupied territory, the government of the occupied territory that decides demolitions, house, you know, the clearing of land, the, 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 ac the acquisition of land, uh, the building of settlements. All of this is, is in the hands of a settler. And Smotrich, by the way, if I'm the head of the Israeli Committee against house demolitions, he's the head of the Israeli Committee for house demolitions. He founded an organization that's called uh, Regavim, 
And Regavim is the organization very active today that pushes the Israeli government to demolish Palestinian homes. And he's now the head of the government of the West Bank, basically. Uh, and Ben Gvir, of course, is the head of the police. And he has his own private army in the West Bank, which is called the, uh, the border police, right? So that these two guys are being used and their, and their agenda is, of course, again, to nail this whole thing down, to extinguish the last flickers of Palestinian resistance. And I just want to say that this isn't only them. In the last, this has been true of all the governments. Every Israeli government has tried to, to extinguish Palestinian resistance, of course, and to expand the apartheid system, whether it's labor or Likud, it doesn't matter. But in the last government, the so-called moderate liberal government of uh, Bennett, who's, who <laughs> heads the settler party, and Yair Lapid, uh, the Minister of Defense was, was uh, Benjamin, it was Benjamin Gantz. Gantz. Uh, uh, you know, Gantz uh, is the one that, uh, that ran for office, uh, ran for, in his election with a video boasting that he killed 4,000 terrorists in, in Gaza. Uh, when he was the head of the army, uh, so that uh, so that uh, Gantz and has uh, uh, also been pushing very much in the last couple of years in Janine and Nablus in particular to extinguish the last uh, the last of Palestinian resistance. So in a sense, this is a, this government might be extreme, but it's really a natural continuation, almost a culmination of the 130 years of Zionism, uh, in which house demolitions, as I said, has played, has played a key role. So that's kind of where we are uh, today, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, I mean, there's plenty of questions, and they all come from different angles. Mm -hmm. But one of the questions is pretty interesting. It's the first one. Um, You've mentioned that we, we're we're ending a chapter or it's the end of uh, of the project. And this, in, in some Zionist approaches, they were thinking about going expanding the Zionist project beyond the borders of historical Palestine to Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, Sinai. Um, is there voices inside Israel, or it's the whole project will finish now within the occupied territories? Within, I mean, it is historical Palestine, sorry. No, the whole process will finish within historical Palestine. There's no, uh, you know, uh, I mean, it was it was kind of a, you know, uh, the concept that the right wing had of Jabotinsky and Begin was that Jordan is the uh, is is an extent is a part of is the western part of the um, of the land of Israel or or the uh, rather the eastern part of the land of Israel, Israel itself or Palestine was the western part of the land of Israel, and Jordan is the eastern part of the land of Israel. And if you look up on, the, on your internet, the emblem of the Herut party, H-E-R-U-T, that was Begin's party that became the Likud. But after that, you'll see their insignia is Palestine and Jordan together with a rifle superimposed. And so what Israel's claim has always been is, look, we've already made our concession. We gave up all of eastern, east, the eastern part of the land of Israel. All we want is the, this little eastern part. Is that too much to ask? You see? And, so, uh, and so there is that concept. But it isn't, a, it isn't a, uh, an active political concept today. No one is really advocating for expanding Israel beyond Historic Palestine, which is which is enough uh, for Zionism. Um, so some people are asking about how they can get your map. Is it possible to share it on the chat, or is it like can we get it from the no, ICAD no. website? Uh, it's probably on the ICAD website, um, uh, which is ICAD.org. We have, uh, I, I'm pretty sure it's there. Uh, if not, I can send it to you, Omar. Maybe it's Sabil, and you can pass it on to other people. Or let me know, and I'll send me an email, jeffhelper at, at gmail.com. 
and uh, and I'll send it to you. And tomorrow, actually, you're having um, ICAD is having a, um, a webinar with Tent of Nations at 5 p.m. London time. So it's 7 p.m. Jerusalem time. So I don't know what time it is in your time zone. Um, do you want to promote? master in the whole uh, Tent of Nations uh, community there is really under tremendous pressure. They had a court case yesterday. I haven't heard what the verdict is. And they're really in the... I think maybe in the last phases of being able to hold out against being uh, their land being taken and and that whole place being a part of a settlement, we'll have to see. But yes, we have a a, um, a webinar with not with Daoud uh, tomorrow. So Linda has written in the chat that the maps are on the ICAD website, um, uh, found in the section on resources and analysis. So please go to ICAD, www.icad.org. So some people are saying that the maps are, are not downloading or there seems to be a problem. Um, so if that is something that is, uh, and maybe Linda or the people could double check it. Right, okay. If you have a problem, contact me. I mean, you're not, unfortunately, you're not thousands of people. <laughs> So contact me, Jeff Helper at gmail.com and I'll uh, and I'll send you them. Oh, hopefully. Um and Regavim gets tax deductible um, contributions from US citizens. Um, um is that uh, is that hmm. confirmed? Yes, there's a campaign which you should all look up and, and join called Defunding Racism. Mm -hmm. by a number of organizations, uh, including the Good Shepherd Collective and others, that's focusing on, uh, Regavim is registered as a 501c3, as a nonprofit in the state of New York. And, uh, and they're trying to get it deregistered. So there's a whole campaign uh, uh, with uh, uh, Leticia James, who's the attorney general of the state of New York, to try to defund uh, Regavim. Regavim is also a registered charity in the UK. Uh, so that, uh, you know, so that. Sorry, it was or it registered. is still? Pardon me? It was or is it still registered? I think it's still registered okay. uh, in the UK. Uh, and so uh, look up defunding racism. You get a lot of information about that and, and, and you can join that campaign. Thank you. Um, so um, we have a question. Hello from Germany. I interviewed Jeff a few times for German media. In one interview, he said the occupation will soon end. Are you, Jeff, Jeff still optimistic on the long run? Well, yes and no. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't talk about occupation anymore. You know, like you said at the beginning, Omar, my thought, my thoughts and my vocabulary have changed over the years. As the facts on the ground have changed, the situation has changed, you have to evolve with, with, with the times, you know. Many of us on the left supported the two-state solution 30 years ago, partly because the PLO supported the two-state solution. Um, but of course, it's ridiculous today. So your thoughts have to keep changing. And I don't talk much about occupation anymore because I think the occupation has been overtaken by uh, an apartheid system over the entire country. Don't forget in the amnesty reports and human rights reports and Batsalem, they talk about the entire country being an apartheid regime, not only the occupied territories and settler colonialism which is a very important concept because again, the whole purpose of Zionism was to take over the entire country of Palestine, not 78% not of it. So the very idea that, um, that an occupation would end uh, means from the Zionist point of view, because Israel has always denied there's an occupation and the United States accepted the fact, if you go to the State Department, they don't talk about occupation. They call it a, a they call the West Bank and Gaza um, a disputed territories. 
So they've taken the entire uh, uh, foundation of international law that supported the Palestinian cause, especially the 14th Convention on, on, on Occupation, out of the equation. Uh, and they've made, uh, they've made uh, Israel's claims over the occupied territories as legitimate and equal to those of the Palestinians by, by, uh, by calling them uh, 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 disputed territories. So I, I don't think we should talk so much about occupation anymore. I think we have to start talking about settler colonialism, which isn't easy because it's a very academic term. And maybe apartheid is better to use because people get it. And then we'll back into the settler colonial thing. The only way out, in my, in my opinion, and that's what my book is about, I'm, I'm myself and ICAD are part of a Palestinian-led organization called the One Democratic State Campaign. And we have a 10-point program for transforming the country into one democratic state of equal citizenship for everyone, the return of the refugees, of course, and the emergence of what we call a new political community of Palestinians and Israelis and whoever lives here uh, all, all together. Uh, and that it's the only way out. It sounds utopian. It sounds, you know, uh, you know, almost far-fetched, but I think it's a doable thing. It was, it was doable in South Africa. I believe we can replicate what the ANC did. Um, uh, so that when you, you ask me if I'm optimistic or not optimistic, I'm optimistic in that there is a way out. And I think we've formulated the basis, and obviously our plan's not the plan. There's a lot of work that has to be done, but I think we've, we've given a good, a good definition and direction to it. Um, where I get less optimistic or, or depressed sometimes is, is when we're not politically organized. In order to be in a political struggle, you have to have three things. You have to have a political plan, you have to have an organization, and you have to have a strategy. And we have none of those things. The good news is that we do have tremendous allies, very powerful allies. And those allies are all of you. The international civil society, the grassroots, the people of the world are very much, in my view, uh, they've moved towards the Palestinian cause. Even the Jewish community in the United States, the young people have moved towards the Palestinian cause. I think that, but, and there's thousands of Palestinian uh, uh, solidarity organizations abroad BDS, of course, is, is a very important part of it all. Many of you are involved with all of that. But what we're lacking is a political program. I mean, you're not going to liberate Palestine from Kansas City or uh, Sheffield or, or Germany or wherever. Uh, there has to be a political program that you can all mobilize around. And if there is, I think we can change our government's policy. I think we could, we could generate a worldwide movement like the anti-apartheid movement, you know, but the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa always had an end game. One person, one vote. That was it. And when the clerk came to Mandela in prison and said, well, let's do power sharing. Let's do this. Let's do that. He said, once there's one person, one vote, I'm out of prison and we start all over again. And that's really what we need. We need that end game. Now, that end game can only be articulated by Palestinians. This is a Palestinian struggle. And it's only the, you know, I can support the Palestinians as an anti-colonial Israeli. We can all support Palestinians, uh, and, and, and we have to in the ways that we have, but we can't dictate to Palestinians what the solution is, where they should go in their liberation struggle. They have to do that. And of course, you know, cutting all the slack I can to the Palestinians, you know, their problem has been that they've been scattered, they've been fragmented by Israel and the international community in an intentional way. And, and the PLO was dismantled 30 years ago by Arafat and, and Abu Mazen. We have to say that. There is no more Palestinian liberation organization to, 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 to unite all the Palestinian factions and communities and so on. And so the Palestinians really have, you know, a major task before them 
before they can begin to articulate a political program. And that's trying to generate the unity or some kind of, of political framework of communication and so on to build a consensus around a political program that in my view, at least in many Palestinians of our organization, the One Democratic State Campaign is a one state program. So that, um, so that in a sense, you know, you might say we're waiting on the Palestinians and things are happening. You know, there is a movement among Palestinians, and Omar, you can talk to this, um, of trying to revive the PLO, of trying to have new elections to the Palestinian National Council, the PNC. I, I, I mean, Palestinians are very aware of this, that they have to have this kind of liberation organization again in order to move their cause forward. Uh, but they have tremendous uh, problems, of course, not just logistically with all the communities being so uh, disconnected, but the fact that the Palestinian Authority under Abu Mazen, Abu Mazen is the chair of the PLO. And again, in my view, he's a collaborator. So he's not, a matter of fact, in October, when there was a, a, a meeting of Palestinians to uh, try to, uh, to um, initiate this campaign of elections, they were all arrested by the Palestinian Authority. All the, uh, the Palestinians, including uh, uh, the head of our group, the One Democratic State Campaign. So, you know, they have a tremendous obstacle there. But my optimism again comes from the fact that, that I think when a critical mass of Palestinians do, uh, do organize and they come together around a political program that I believe will be similar to the political program that uh, the one state program that we're promoting, um, uh, then they can mobilize all of you, the international grassroots. And then I'm very optimistic that we can replicate what the ANC did. I don't think that's a pipe dream, I, but, but we have to have the organization, we have to have the program, and we have to have the strategy. I write about this in my new book uh, or my latest book, uh, decolonizing Israel, uh, liberating Palestine. I write about this whole process and the strategy. And of course, it's based on our one state program. Um, I have to apologize. Um, uh, Zoom kicked me out. So I lost many of the questions that were in chat. So please, if I haven't answered ask your question, please do write them again. My apologies or cut and paste and send them again. So do you think a political framework for a one state democracy would attract Hamas at this time? Or I mean, extremists or people who I mean, it is, it's, um, who are even rejecting to live as neighbors um, in two different countries, how can they live, share the same country? Well, I mean, there has to be a, a, a you know, it's not an easy thing for people to get their minds around, certainly not Israelis, but also Palestinians. Um, it, the one state idea was always the PLO's position from, from, the, from the beginning, um, um, you know, the 1968 charter, all, you know, and it all, always talked about a one state idea. They had the right idea in the beginning that they're in an anti-colonial struggle against, uh, against, uh, uh, against Zionism. They, they were right about that. Um, but, uh, you know, what's happened is, uh, is that, um, uh, you know, with all the disappointment, you know, they, they gave up, essentially the, the PLO gave up the anti-colonial struggle in order to get into the Oslo. They, they were kind of promised or they thought that, that you, the United States and even Rabin would somehow give them a, a, a small Palestinian state you know, in, in, in the West Bank and Gaza, and maybe East Jerusalem. So they put all their eggs into that basket. And of course, uh, Edward Said and others knew that, that was, there was no basket uh, from the very beginning. But so you had that whole disappointment and discouragement. And then of course, the last 30 years of this tremendous, uh, um, the, the violence against Palestinians, the repression, the settlements, uh, the marginalization of the Palestinians, even in the Arab world to, to, to a large degree, and certainly among governments. 
all this has really created a sense of despair. And when you're in a despair, you don't think politically. You know, I, I, you know I'm, not, I'm not saying this is a criticism. Most Palestinians here are trying to survive. You know, they, they, they invested a lot and they paid a huge price in two intifadas uh, for a Palestinian state. And it never happened. So now they're, 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 they don't have that political space much anymore. They're trying to survive. Again, there's no contact with the refugee community. And, uh, and you've got the PA, so you're living under two occupations, basically. Uh, uh, so that so that there is a sense of despair, and uh, and so you know I think you know our trouble our problem when we're trying to get the one state program out when our Palestinian comrades are trying to present it to Palestinians uh, in the occupied territory and other places, you know they get back this thing about it's utopian, it's not going to happen. Israel's not going to allow it to happen. So in some ways, the Palestinians have internalized Israel as the deciding factor. You know, well, you can't allow a, col a colonial power to determine your liberation struggle. So, so, you know, there's this idea, first of all, that it's utopian. And second of all, um, after that, a lot of Palestinians, understandably, especially in this environment, don't really want to entertain the idea of living together with Israelis. <laughs> That's not their concept of liberation, in my view. I think most Palestinians, although I don't want to represent Palestinians, certainly, Omar, stop me when I'm crossing the red line. Um, but I think mo for most Palestinians, the idea of liberation was liberation. In other words, we liberate Palestine, and Palestine becomes Palestine again, it becomes a Palestinian state, and what happens to Israeli Jews, we, we don't really want to deal with that too much. We don't care, or we don't want to deal with it, or, or they'll become a religious minority. Certainly the idea that Israeli Jews are a national group that will become a national group in a binational country, this one state idea, most Palestinians don't want to, don't accept that. And so ironically, when we come to Palestinians, especially the young generation with the one state idea, but you see the, problem, you see, the idea of total liberation, of the country being liberated and becoming Palestine again, that's a, that's a, a classic colonial concept, you know, when, that the third world had in the 1950s and 60s and so on. You know, when, uh, when, uh, we, when the Mau Mau liberate Kenya, it becomes Kenya and the British leave. When we liberate India, the British are out. When we liberate Algeria, the French go. You see, that's, that's the idea, of course. But settler colonialism is different. In settler colonialism, the settlers stay. If they're strong enough to establish a state, like the Zionists were in Israel, or they're strong enough to establish a, a, a strong administrative presence, um, they're too strong to, to expel. And there's never been a situation, in my view, in which settlers have been expelled by the local population. The, in, in, in France, in, in Algeria, the French settlers left, but they weren't expelled by the FLN, they, but, the, but they left out, out, out of fear. Otherwise, settlers stay. And so this is a, a, a development, a, a different kind of colonialism that the Palestinians have never really dealt with. So from their point of view, liberation has to be kind of, you have to have liberation on the one hand, but on the other hand, you're going to be stuck with half a population of your liberated country that's Israeli. And the Israelis see themselves as a national group. So how do you deal with that? How do you reconcile your concept of liberation with, with the fact that after settler colonialism ends, the settlers are still there. Uh, and so all of that is really important to, to deal with. And I deal with it in my book and our One Democratic State deals with it in our, in our program, but it's not something that Palestinians wanna talk about today. Well, understandably, absolutely understandably, why, why would they? So we're in a situation where, in a way, in a sense, actually, that... uh, Jeff, I want to. I mean, it is, it's. Okay. I'd like to say that Palestinians talk about it a lot, but I think okay. it is people don't listen to what they say. So it is, 
Um, until the 8, 70s, I think, maybe early 80s, people were saying just send them back to the sea, wherever they came from, or right. like literally right. that it is just like that's not our problem. They came as invaders, they need to leave. But late, uh, I mean, in the last two decades, more, and I think that was like more the talk of uh, right wing uh, Palestinians, they, they would say you have to stay, you can stay. But in a, a right. form of, it's like a different mentality, but it's out of mercy. You can stay, but you cannot be equal to us. That's right. In a way that it is, it's not going to expel you because that's become your home, but you cannot also like have equal share of Palestine. You could be a religious so that is like, minority. In a way, sorry? You could be a religious minority. You can be a religious minority or you can. So so actually they try to divide between the two groups, at least on a, on paper, on theory level. So um, Palestinian Jews or Jews from Arab descent, you can stay as Palestinians. So that's even in the literature of Hamas. But if you came as a white person from France or so on, go home. That's not your home. So it's like it's a way of like how they do it. Now there's people who come and say, but I mean, it is, it's actually very similar to some of the Israelis, like creating like an apartheid for Israelis somehow, like a different mm -hmm. standards. Yeah. And few are saying maybe it is it's let's live together. And I think that's very strong within the people inside Israel, even within the Islamic movements and so on. Yeah. They see that it is doable. It's not like a, an impossible mission. But now the problem is that we have is actually the newer generation. We've lost the development of thought and we're going back to square one. We don't want to live together. So this is what we hear from the younger people. And they say it is it's. Um, we tried peace, doesn't work. We tried simple resistance, doesn't come, and so on. So their their mindset is like as if they are on drugs. But whether Palestinians or Israeli, they 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 believe strongly that they can make the other disappear, and that's the problem that we have. And they believe it. They're very strong believers in it. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's why I'm I. The title of my talks when I go to my presentations is is the one state, the uh, one democratic state, subtitled, it's time to get political. In other words, I understand completely why Palestinians would be reactive and why they would just want to reject life with Israelis. I mean, look how they're living. Look what Israel's doing to them. Why wouldn't they have that mindset? You know, you're demolishing our houses. And killing us every day, and I mean, you know, not just like uh, like some civil little civil rights uh, discrimination. I mean, this is really a murderous, violent campaign that's that they've lived with, they've grown up with. So I can understand that. But you know, it, there's an interesting paradox, and that is, you know, you're living this this terrible existence. A political analysis requires a certain distance. <laughs> Oh, not quite academic, but it requires a cold analysis where you sit down and you say, all right, where are we? What are our interests? What do we need? How do we get there? What, how do we deal with, you know, it's a mindset that obviously people living under such pressure as they are, as you all are uh, in the West Bank and even, even in Israel to some degree and certainly in the refugee camps, it's a political space you don't have. And so, in a way, the question is, how do you, how do you create that space, that 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 conversation, even an intra-Palestinian discussion? Forget about that. Um, many, ways, but I mean, it is. You know, it's, I want to allow you to move into a political space rather than being reactive. Um, uh, so there's actually, um, I'd like to also like to ask a question that is very related to the discussion. Because it is, you're coming with an idea in the book of a one-state solution, how to, to solve the problem from its root problems. Others are coming with an, um, is like we cannot live together and we need to find a way to get totally rid of the other. But in a way, it is many people are arguing, and that's very much even within the international observers, when you get like people who are military experts or people who are like um, more on the conservative, they say the status quo is not that bad. You're, you're exaggerating, you know, it is last 2022 was the highest, the most violent year in 20 years. And maybe like around 250 people died, that included a war, that included like multiple uprisings, that included like um, a series of attacks. So it's not as bad the status quo. Look, people are working, people are living and so on. How, 
Um, do you feel that the status quo could be like an idea of keeping it for like another few decades? Well, that's what Israel is trying to do. That's why I talk about a delicate dance that it's doing. How to re repress Palestinians, take their land, confine them to little Bantu stands, uh, you know, quell their resistance and make everything quiet, you quietize everything. Um, so that so that um, so that the international community can kind of put the Palestinian issue aside and go on with what it wants to do. It wants Israel to help. You know, Israel and the United States attacked Iran last week. They attacked a, a drone factory in Islamabad together. You know, the United States wants Israel, you know, to attack Iran and be its surrogate in the Middle East. Biden has talked about a NATO of the Middle East. Saudi Arabia and Egypt want Israel, you know, as a counterpart to uh, to Iran on the one hand, but also, you know, Israel exports a lot of repressive technologies, uh, surveillance and policing technologies and other things that allow these repressive regimes to stay in power. So they need Israel. From the, I think that's one reason why Morocco is, you know, is interested in uh, in relations with Israel. Not to mention its own fight, its own occupation in Western Sahara. So there's a lot they also of- love, They have also a non, an acceptable non-democratic regime in, the, in their midst, also these that's, regimes. That's right. So in other words, it, it, the international community needs Israel in a way, but the deal is sort of, look, we, would, we want to work with you, Israel. We want to normalize with you. We, we need you to do things for us, but you've got to keep the Palestinian issue under the radar. You know, you, you can't, it embarrasses us. You know, now when Blinken came to last week uh, to Israel, he wanted to talk about Iran, but he was forced by the events on the ground and Ben Gvir and all these guys, he was forced to talk about the Palestinian issue. He was forced to go to Ramallah and talk to Abu Mazen that he didn't want to do. You see, that's what messes it up. So that's what I'm saying. If Israel succeeds, and maybe it'll take, you know, another, uh, another couple months, in Janine, if Israel succeeds in quietizing the Palestinian front, in, in, in repressing the resistance to a degree that, you know, there might be here and there an isolated attack, but, but the resistance is pretty much quelled uh, and things become quiet again, and Israel keeps a lid on it, that allows the international community to go on with its, with its business. And that's what it wants. So that's the open question. Can Israel do that? Or can the Palestinians, you know, can the Palestinians continue the resistance at a tremendous cost? But you know, from my point of view, the question is, what's the point of resistance <laughs> if you don't have a plan of where you're going? Resistance is important. You've got to have resistance, you know, otherwise you lose. But at the same time, you can't win, you can't prevail, you can't liberate yourself unless you have a proactive plan, and that's missing. So Hamas throws its missiles. These Palestinian young people in Jenin fight the Israeli army. All that happens, but without a, it's it's not political in a way. It's again, it's kind of reactive, and uh, and and you know, I'm just I I really feel awful that Palestinians are losing some of their most uh, you know they're young people they're losing. I mean, these are massacres that are going on because you're not going to fight the Israeli army. The whole idea of an armed struggle against Israel is suicide almost. Um, but with the lack of a hope and lack of a, of a future vision and the, with despair that then prevents the formulation of a political program that will move you forward, that's what you're left with. And that, that's tragic. Um, I'm going to ask um, one final question because we're running out of time. So. Um, the question is, is we, we go back to Tel Aviv. Is there any hope in the Jewish-Israeli protests happening at the moment? No, no. They have nothing to do with uh, what we're talking about. Palestinian rights, occupation. No, that, 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 the Israelis have completely washed their hands of that. It's become a non-issue in Israel. It all has to do with uh, Netanyahu and the ju judiciary reform. They want to neutralize the Supreme Court. Um, 
um, you know, it has to do with, um, I mean, that's the main thing. And then of course, there's other, there's some other issues as well. Um, um, but, uh, you know, but essentially it's, it's this judicial re reform thing. So the whole, the whole, uh, the whole, the slogans of the demonstrations are save Israeli democracy. I mean, nobody sees the contradiction between a democracy <laughs> and holding uh, millions of people under apartheid, violent apartheid, because Israel has really insulated itself. Israel has become a closed little box. It sees itself as a liberal European democracy. And the whole Palestinian thing has been marginalized even for Israelis themselves. So it's, so if you go to the demonstration, there was 100,000 100, people yesterday were I live very close to the Knesset, to the parliament. They were right up the street. Everybody's dressed decked in Israeli flags. I mean, I, I, I've gone to some of the demonstrations. I'm not used to going to demonstrations where people are wrapped in Israeli flags or, or, or carrying flags and so on. So in other words, it's very Israeli. It's very internal oriented towards internal things. And the whole, all these issues of I mean, nobody cares what Smotrich does with the civil administration in the West Bank. I'll bet you, I'll bet you that 95% of Israeli Jews, if you ask them, what is the civil administration? They've never heard of it. Never heard of it. They have no idea whatsoever what goes on over there. So that it's really not a part of the agenda and it's, it's not a part of these demonstrations. And also, um, but when they talk about keeping Israel or Israel as a democratic state, they mean only for all Israelis? Do they like also like, are they concerned about Israeli Arabs inside Israel? Not about the West Bank and Gaza, different, but I mean about inside Israel or they only talk no. about Israeli Jews? No. Yesterday, there was a press conference of the opposition party. You know, uh, Lapid, Gantz, Mirav Michaeli from the Labour Party, you know, all the, the, the parties in the opposition, a joint announcement and a press conference, you know, against what Netanyahu, the Netanyahu government is doing. The Arab Party were not invited, you know? Uh, and so, you know, they're really inside Israel, they're not a part of the equation, uh, you know, wh wh whatsoever. So, I always say, you know, Israel is a vibrant democracy if you're Jewish, <laughs> you see? And that's the thing, they wanna keep this vibrant democracy for them. And that's, that's where it ends. Arabs, whether in Israel or in the occupied territories are, are just, they're outside of the box. They're not, they're not things you think about, you know, they're it's an invisible part of society, uh, you know? And uh, unfortunately that's the way it is. Yeah, it's very sad, depressing, yeah, because yeah, I mean, yeah. we, we are all in different uh, planets and it's, uh, I mean, there's people dying every, um, uh, every day. Palestinians but, I wanna end, but I want to end on an up note, Omar. I don't want to end on this uh, depressing. And that is that again, you know, uh, there is the beginning of a political program, the one state idea, there are Palestinian efforts underway to, to try to revive a PLO, to try to, to, to get to some kind of unity a little bit. Or, so things are happening. And I think, again, if we think politically and begin to work on that level, I, I'm, I am op optimistic that we can overcome Zionism and the colonialism, and we can get to a, to a, a real democracy for everybody. I, I mean, it sounds Pollyannish, but I really do believe that if if we think politically and and are strategic and and are organized, so I want to end on that note that there is a way out, and that the political struggle can succeed. Um, it's a process of getting there and and doing it, but but I want to end on that idea rather than on the idea that this is a dead end and we've all lost and let's just go home and and forget about it all. That, that's not where I want to end it. True, but I mean, reality is also the reality. And well, but you change reality. Yeah. And that's that's what we're trying to do, Jeff, um, with people, amazing people like you, with people on this call. Um, we're 
we're dreamers, we believe we have the power, we have the faith um, in ourselves, in our communities, in God, that we're going to be able to change this uh, um, reality. Because it's we have to live together. There's no option. Depending on how you know how you're going to look at it, it's going to cost us how much time or energy or or uh, losing loved ones. We it is it's it's a must. We have to live together. Um, there's no option. Um, and I wish we'd be able to stay longer on this call, but it's um, it's the hour has passed. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure. Take care, friends. Bye. Thank you. Bye.